Hello, my name is Daniel Popovich. I'm the Chief of Colorectal Surgery at St. Francis Hospital in Roslyn, Long Island. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Keller for inviting me to give this talk on the middle colics not reaching and what do we do now. Here's a picture of me from the first time that I gave this talk, so that way you can see me since I'm not able to be there in person today. Here are my disclosures. So who already knows what to do if you're doing a left colon resection and you've done all your usual maneuvers and yet you can't get attention-free anastomosis? And this was a poll that I posted several years ago leading up to the first time I gave this talk on the Sage's Colorectal Web's, uh, Facebook group. And what we found is that many surgeons did know the answer in terms of retroileal tunnel or doing a Deloyer's procedure, but because there were so few uh, responses, I felt that many uh, surgeons might not know some of your alternative options. So why haven't I heard of this before? Well, mostly because it's an uncommon issue. Most of the time when we do our usual maneuvers, we're able to get attention-free anastomosis and we've never been faced with the on-the-spot issue of not being able to get things to reach. And it's also not something we usually talk about pre-op because it's not that common. And additionally, as I mentioned, these maneuvers usually work, taking the IMA, taking the IMV, fully mobilizing the flexure, mobilizing the rectum so it can come up and join uh, the proximal colon, almost always these situations will lead to attention-free anastomosis. So when is it applicable? Meaning when would we consider doing some of these other maneuvers? And the times where this can come into play is particularly with left colon resections or recurrent sigmoid operations where uh, length has already been achieved um, at the first operation, um, particularly for distal transverse cancers, splenic flexure cancers, um, and descending sigmoid resections, sometimes even in Hartman reversals, depending on how much was removed at the first operation. But more importantly, any time that you've already taken your IMA, IMV, completely mobilized the splenic flexure, and you just can't get the conduit to reach, that's when these other options are available to you. But what about this? Uh, this is a video uh, that I found on YouTube, the link is above, of some surgeons who are doing a left colon resection and they're doing a beautiful medial dissection with the intent of taking the IMV first, which they're going to do right here. And now as they go laterally to take off the uh, hepatocolic ligament, um, what you'll see is, is that they're uh, taking with the ligature some fat that maybe is a little bit thicker than just the omentum. And what we see here is, is it looks like we've created a hole in the mesentery, probably taking some of the transverse mesocolon. And indeed, when they flip the colon around here, you'll see that ischemic segment. And oops, they've taken the mesentery to their conduit. So although this was not going to be the area that they were going to resect, um, it was necessary to have blood supply in order to have a healthy, viable conduit. And we'll come back to this later. So when we're doing a mobilization for a left colon resection, it's important that we do medial and lateral dissection. It doesn't matter what you do first as long as it's all done. So laterally, we focus on the white line and the retroperitoneal attachments and including taking down the splenic flexure. And this is what that looks like, um, just showing the lateral portions of the dissection and bringing down that proximal colon so it can reach a tension-free anastomosis. But often is the case where the tension is not necessarily coming from the lateral attachments, it's coming from medial, the mesentery and the blood supply. Uh, so let's just review this for a moment. Um, we, at our, uh, our proximal colon is supplied by the SMA and the iliocolic and right colic and middle colic branches. And our distal colon is um, supplied by our IMA uh, with the left colic and sigmoidal branches coming off. And there is a, a watershed area here where there's going to be a connection between the left branch and the middle colic and the left colic coming off of the IMA. Um, and that's going to uh, um, continue on through a marginal uh, vessel. But sometimes what we notice is, is depending on how we've done our high ligations, that despite doing a full lateral mobilization, the tension of bringing the colon down from the anastomosis is actually coming from this marginal branch, which is tugging back on the middle colic vessels itself. And so despite having full lateral mobilization and a floppy bowel over the top, 
our mesentery is tight like a guitar string against the retroperitoneum and it is causing tension. So some specific situations where this is an issue, uh, where we can't, um, uh, any situation where we can't use the left colon for a rectal or low pelvic anastomosis uh, for insufficient length, inadequate blood supply, maybe it's severely diseased and thickened from diverticular disease, uh, maybe they've already had a left colectomy or sigmoid resection, so the conduit is shorter and needs to go further into the transverse colon. Maybe there are synchronous cancers, so you're taking uh, the middle colics and you're taking uh, the IMA. Uh, maybe they've had a previous AAA repair and the IMA is out, so you can't save that left colic branch coming up off of the IMA. What we know that we need to make a healthy anastomosis is good, healthy bowel, very well vascularized, good blood supply, uh, tissue with adequate length, which is often left to our judgment in the operation, and tension-free, um, which again, a lot of it is up to our judgment in the operating room. Um, so in situations where you can't get that to reach, you could just fall back and do a total colectomy with an iliorectal anastomosis. The pros of this is that certainly you're going to have a tension-free, well-perfused anastomosis, and it's relatively easy to do to take the residual colon and bring the ileum down. But the cons are that you lose your uh, ileocolic valve and the right colon, and therefore there's a lot of decreased water absorption, which for this patient is going to lead to an increased frequency of bowel movements, and often is the case that these patients are in the older age groups, and they don't tolerate this that well. So additional options. We'll focus first on transmesenteric lowering of the colon, um, and now uh, referred to as a retroileal uh, tunnel. And here's a picture of what that looks like. This was first described by Toupe in 1961. Yes, that's the same Toupe as for uh, foregut surgery. And he described this in left colectomies, splenic flexure resections, where he didn't like the way that the colon laid on top of the small intestine and he created a tunnel underneath the uh, mesentery um, to the left of the superior mesenteric artery so that the colon would sit posteriorly and give a couple more centimeters of length. And this was later described, maybe almost 20 years later, by Rambeau and Turnbull, where they did the tunneling to the right of the SMA below the iliocolic pedicle because they found that it gave uh, further length to not be stretched to the left side of the SMA. And that allowed for further reachability because it's the colon conduit becomes the most posterior structure in the abdomen and not draped over the top of the small bowel. And so going back to that case that I showed at the beginning where they inadvertently took the marginal branch to their conduit, here's how they're gonna remedy their situation. They excised um, the colon just proximal to the area of ischemia and here they're making a tunnel underneath the iliocolic artery from the superior side of things, looking down to the pelvis, and they're going to create a window here. And there's the tunnel, and they're just going to widen this a little bit more to allow for some room. and they're gonna pass their conduit through this tunnel. And we can see now how nicely that this conduit is gonna reach the pelvis, not having to be draped over top of the small bowel, and they're going to create their tension-free anastomosis. And this is what the final picture would look like. So the pros of doing a retroileal tunnel is that it allows to preserve or save the majority of the colon. Essentially, anything that will reach um, for as much of the colon uh, that you can and pull it posteriorly to the iliocolic pedicle um, uh, will work. It doesn't take that long to do as long as you don't mind looking at the anatomy from that direction. The cons, it has been associated with internal hernias, just like gastric bypass procedures because of the tunnel and the mesentery. 
Um, the colon can also additionally become obstructed in this window that has been described. And lastly, if the middle colics are short, this procedure still will not work to get you length. And that's where the Deloyer's procedure comes in. And this is the creation of an anastomosis between the right colon or the proximal transverse colon, depending on where things demarcate, and down to the rectum after complete mobilization and rotation of the right colon and leaving essentially just the ileocolic pedicle as the blood supply. And the original description of this was in 1964. Um, it was 11 patients, and the indications for surgery were ulcerative colitis, megacolon for unknown reasons, constipation, and left-sided only polyposis. Um, and uh, since then, it's always been an option, but not really talked about. So let's go through the steps, no particular order, because it all needs to be done. You're going to take the middle colic artery and vein, and you are going to see where the bowel begins to demarcate. You are going to completely mobilize the transverse colon all the way around the hepatic flexure, all the way down the right colon, and including the terminal ileum, mobilizing that TI mesentery all the way back up to the duodenum the way we do when we make J pouches. And then we're going to take the rest of the colon mesentery, preserving only the ileocolic pedicle. You're also going to do an appendectomy because just like malrotation procedures, LADS procedures, the appendix is now going to sit in an abnormal location and to not create confusion in the future if they get appendicitis, you just take it out. The description of the procedure is to do a counterclockwise rotation of the colon, and that's what you're going to see in the videos coming up, but it has been described that you can go clockwise, and because the rotation on the ileocolic pedicle is only 180 degrees in either direction, it really doesn't lead to any poor blood flow or venous return and then you're going to make your anastomosis. Uh, here is a schematic of essentially what this looks like. Uh, in this picture, they're showing the preservation of the right colic vessels as well, although uh, most descriptions is taking uh, the right colic and, and rotating on the axis of the ileocolic alone. You're going to do a counterclockwise rotation by putting the cecum underneath the liver and bring down your conduit for your anastomosis. And here's a very nice video of this. Um, what they're doing now is the lateral mobilization of the transverse colon by taking down the hepatocolic ligament. Now they've dissected down to the root of the middle colic vessels. Here's the artery uh, that they're going to clip and then divide, and then the vein clip and divide. Um, they're going to keep uh, coming across the colon mesentery towards the hepatic flexure. Uh, and then they're going to take down the hepatic flexure here. They're heading down the right colon. And then coming from inferiorly, they're mobilizing the TI and the TI mesentery and meeting their dissection from superior. So now the entire right colon is going to be freed. And now this is them mobilizing the rest of the ileal mesentery. Here they're going to do their appendectomy. Uh, in this video, they didn't show the actual step of the rotation, but you can see that they created a nice tension-free anastomosis with their cecum up underneath the liver. There's the stump of the appendix. To give you a better uh, uh, visualization of this, this is an open version of the same procedure. Um, the head is up here to the screen left and the feet are down here to the screen right. This was a Hartman reversal procedure uh, where there was inadequate length and they converted to an open operation, did all the steps that you um, saw in that previous video. And they're going to show now very nicely, um, there is the transverse colostomy right there. Um, and they're going to show how this rotation is going to go counterclockwise. There's the ileocecal valve, counterclockwise rotation, and putting that transverse uh, colostomy site in the proximal transverse colon down for the anastomosis with uh, zero tension and the cecum sitting up uh, cephalad. And here's a picture of the final anatomy. There is data for this, but again, it's pretty sparse because it is not that common. Um, here is a series of 48 patients for the indications that you see here. This is essentially everything we talked about that you can imagine that you might need to do this. Um, 
31 of these patients did have a diverting stoma at the time of the operation and all were closed. There were zero anastomotic leaks. Um, Follow-up was about two years and the median number of bowel movements for these patients with closed stomas was three. Two thirds of these patients had less than three a day. One patient had a poor functional result and chose to go back to having a stoma. In another series of 14 patients, um, again, for the same reasons of, of uh, resection, um, ileostomy was created in a little more than half of them. The median height of the anastomosis was around 11 centimeters. Uh, and the data was really, really good. Um, even though the follow-up for this study was only about a year uh, for all patients, um, all ileostomies were closed. Bowel function was median uh, two per 24 hours and zero patients with any degree of major or minor fecal incontinence. In conclusion, there are more options uh, when you can't get your left colon uh, conduit to reach than just creating an ileorectal anastomosis and sacrificing the rest of the colon. The retroileal tunnel and uh, right colon inversion, the Deloyer's procedure for pelvic anastomosis are safe and feasible. You just have to be aware of the anatomy and the steps. Um, sufficient length and adequate blood supply can definitely be achieved. Um, and that's what these procedures offer us. Uh, the additional benefit is the preservation of the ileocecal valve and the water absorbing properties of the right colon. So there's improved bowel function compared to an ileorectal anastomosis. And again, it's associated with pretty low morbidity and good bowel function. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to have given this lecture and be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any.